Hello, this is Pastor Laura Cavendish at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Asheville. Um, we are reading Making Sense of the Cross. We're in Chapter 3, Ransom and Victory, and we are at Part B. Now, the last time we were together, we um, went over four questions that we're going to be using to approach um, our discussion about the cross and and. The first question was, what's broken about the relationship between God and humanity? And then how does Jesus' cross repair what's broken? Or how, does, how that is, does atonement happen? Third question is, what is God like? The fourth one is, what picture of the Christian life does each theory give? So Marianne, do you think we're ready to jump in? Absolutely. Where do we start? As I mentioned, there have been a number of explanations of the cross over the years. Too many to cover all of them in detail. Of them all, though, three have stood out as the most important and most widely accepted. One described the cross as ransom and victory. Another as substitution, satisfaction, and sacrifice and another as example and encouragement. When we look at the go- looked at the Gospels, we started with the earliest Gospel, Mark. And I think it might make similar sense to start with the earliest theory of atonement, like the Gospels. These theories each developed over time as well. Okay, so is the earliest theory of atonement the cross as ransom and victory? Yes, it is. And this theory was popular among Christians for almost a thousand years. I should warn you, though, that of all three, it will probably feel the most peculiar. Really? Why? Mostly because our view of the world has changed dramatically over the years. And this understanding of the cross is strongly influenced by views and assumptions of the ancient world, some of which will feel very foreign to us. So perhaps it will be most helpful to first describe it in general and then to go about asking and answering our four questions to help us assess it. Sounds good. Okay, so the ancient theory of atonement, sometimes called the classical theory, because it comes from the classical Greco-Roman world. Understands world. This theory understands world history as the dramatic struggle between good and evil. In Christian terms, that gets played out more specifically as the struggle between God and the devil, who is also sometimes called Satan. The first move in this drama is God's creation of the world, where everything is, as God pronounced, good. The second is when the devil, in the form of a serpent, tempts Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, and they succumb to that temptation and are banished from the Garden of Eden. Traditionally, that scene is called the fall, referring to Adam and Eve's fall from a state of grace, being in right relationship with God, to being in a state of sin, alienated from God because of their disobedience. Okay, I think I'm with you so far. So at this point in the drama, Satan holds the upper hand. In fact... From here on out, Satan holds the upper hand. Why? Early Christians believe that this original sin of Adam and Eve taints or stains all of humanity. That means that the whole human race lives in this state of sin, this state of disobedience, which in turn means that the devil has a claim on us. A claim? I'm not sure I understand that. Again, it's a little tricky because we don't often think this way. But alongside the biblical story of Adam and Eve, there are other stories early Christians knew about the fall of the devil. Okay, now I know I'm not following you. In some teachings in both Judaism and early Christianity of this time, there are stories that the devil was once an angel. In fact, one of the most powerful of God's angels. But this angel, sometimes named Lucifer, rebelled against God and led other angels into rebellion also. Ever since then, 
the devil is given charge over all those who rebel. You're right. This is pretty different from the way we often think. Maybe it will help to look at it this way. According to the ancient world, there were only two choices you can make, or better, only two sides or teams you can be a part of. You can either be part of God's team, which means obeying God, or be part of the devil's team, which is for all those who disobey God. Ah, uh, I think I see. So because Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they're on the devil's team. Right, and it really doesn't matter if they choose this team willingly or were tricked by the devil into sinning and so assigned to it, or just happened to make a naive choice and fell onto it. No matter how it happened, Adam and Eve fell from grace and are now on the devil's side of things. Got it. So that's why the devil has a claim on Adam and Eve. Right, in this life and for all eternity. But what does that have to do with us? Why does Adam and Eve's disobedience affect all of mankind? Good question, and complicated too. See, Adam and Eve not only fall from grace into a state of sin, but when they do so, all of their offspring and all generations ever since are born into this state of sin, this condition where it's easier to disobey rather than obey God. So we're being punished for Adam and Eve's mistake. That doesn't seem fair. Not exactly. The heart of this story, which is meant to be more descriptive than explanatory, is the belief that we inherit Adam and Eve's weaknesses, weakness, their predisposition to take the easy road and disobey God, to look out for ourselves rather than to put others first, and to make bad choices out of our own insecurity and ignorance. But the thing is, we make that condition our own all the time. What do you mean? Just that whatever predisposition to sin we may have, sooner or later we live into it by actually sinning. Ultimately, it's not Adam and Eve's sin that matters to us, but our own. Meaning that each one of us puts himself or herself first, or hurts others, or doesn't care for creation or in so many other ways, disobeys God. Okay, I think I've got it. Adam and Eve may set the example, but we follow it all too easily, and this puts us on the devil's team, so to speak, and gives the devil claim over us. Exactly. And the consequence of this disobedience is separation from God and death. Because we sin, we cannot enjoy eternal life with God. So this is the dilemma the early Christians wrestled with, or to put it in terms we talked about earlier, so that's what's broken. Because Adam and Eve's disobedience, and because of the disobedience of every human since Adam and Eve, the devil and death have a claim on us. Right. And so this is what the cross is supposed to fix. Right again. And how does the cross do that? How does it address this problem? This is where things get interesting. Oh, great, because up till now, everything has been so run-of-the-mill. I know what you mean, but bear with me. This way of putting things together really does get kind of intriguing. So like we said, here's the problem. The devil has claimed to every human being because of sin. And that means that every single one of us no one accepted, is going to miss out on eternal life with God. Death will separate us from God forever. Interestingly, many early Christians think of this whole thing almost as a contract. God set up the rules early on. Those who obey belong to God. Those who disobey belong to Satan. And so when we disobey, we naturally belong to the devil. Those are the rules. But the problem is that God still loves humanity and wants somehow to win us back. And so it sounds like the real problem is not just how God is going to win us back, but about how God is going to abide by the rules that he has set up. That's exactly it. And that's where Jesus comes into the picture? Yes, that's where Jesus comes in. And he enters the picture as the one who is both human and God. Okay, we'll need to slow down a bit now. No problem. 
One of the early Christian beliefs that is still at the heart of the Christian faith is that in Jesus, God became human. We talked a bit about that before, how what we see in God is what we get, though I don't remember what it's called. Incarnation, Latin for in the flesh. And you're right. It's the belief that in Jesus, we get the essential God. That's because, according to Christian faith, the immortal and all-powerful God took on mortal flesh and became human, experiencing all the ups and downs, possibilities, and limitations of human life. John's Gospel sums it up by saying that the eternal Word became flesh and lived among us. That is, God became human in Jesus. I think I'm following, though I can't say I understand it. You're not alone. It took the early church three or four centuries to figure it out. Maybe what's most important to keep in mind at this point is the confession that somehow in Jesus, God is both fully God and at the same time fully human, just like us. Okay, I can live with that for now. But how does this deal with the problem of the devil having claim over all humanity? There are essentially three parts to this. Part one, because Jesus is human, the devil assumes he has a claim on Jesus and so has a right to oversee Jesus' death. Part two, because Jesus is God and therefore sinless, that is, he hasn't done anything wrong and so hasn't been put on the devil's team, the devil actually doesn't have a claim on Jesus. Part three, that means that when the devil claims Jesus on the cross, the devil actually overextends his reach and loses his claim not only on Jesus, but also on all humanity. Wait, 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 I'm really lost. Like I said, it's complicated. Actually, I think you said interesting. Complicated, interesting. Why quibble? But seriously, let's see if we can straighten this out a bit. See what makes sense and what doesn't. I was following pretty well up to the point of the contract and God's dilemma. I can see that the devil, devil would assume Jesus is human and therefore part of his team and someone who would die. Finally, I get that Jesus, if he didn't sin, wouldn't actually deserve to die. But how that all works out is beyond me, for instance, why does Jesus dying affect the rest of us? That's a great question, and there's more than one way to answer it. More than one way? Yeah, yes. Let's keep in mind that this way of thinking about the cross is developed and employed over a thousand years. And so there are a lot of variations that will be true of all three of the theories we identified. What we're really doing is grouping a number of variations together into three schools or models based on their similarities. And so what makes this classic school of ideas similar? They all agree on the dilemma. Humans have sinned, so the devil has claim to them, and Jesus' death frees them from that claim. Okay, but how? Or is that where the variations come in? It is. One variation, proposed by one of the first theologians of the church, a guy named Origen, was that God actually arranged with the devil to give Satan his son, Jesus, as a payment, or as a ransom for all of humanity. The idea was that Satan, given the opportunity to have control over God's son, would jump at this chance, because by controlling the son, he could gain a lot of leverage over the father. Wait, God pays the devil by giving him Jesus? Right. Jesus is the ransom God pays the devil for the rest of humanity. Origen and others look specifically, or look especially to Mark's gospel, where Jesus says, For the Son of Man came not to be saved, served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And there's a verse in one of the letters in the New Testament that has a similar theme. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus himself, human, 
who gave himself a ransom for all. Huh. That's from 1 Timothy. I never heard those verses about ransom before. Are there other verses like that? Not really. And to tell you the truth, there's little indication that when Mark wrote his gospel, that's the kind of ransom he meant. But then why do they build their understanding on the cross on such a small part of the Bible? There are other parts of the New Testament that portray Jesus' death as a struggle. There are whole sections, such as the book of Revelation, that describes the cosmic struggle between God and the devil. But you're right. On the whole, this theory isn't built on specific passages from the Bible, but instead on general themes. But Christians still found it helpful? You have to keep in mind that when we try to make sense of the cross, we're often saying as much about ourselves, our situation, our questions, our struggles, as we are about the cross. Many early Christians found confessing faith in Jesus a struggle. They were sometimes persecuted and at times died for their faith. So it makes some sense that they would understand Jesus' cross as representing a larger struggle between God and the devil, and to look to those portions of Scripture to help them understand both the cross and their lives. That's helpful. Thanks. Okay, so let me see if I'm following. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve and the rest of us, the devil holds humanity hostage, and God offers Jesus as a ransom. The devil accepts thinking he'd rather have the Son of God than all of humanity because that puts him in a pretty good position to get what he wants from God. Right. So why doesn't it work? Why doesn't the devil end up on top? Because death and the devil can't hold Jesus. And Jesus knew that? That's hard to tell. I think the emphasis of these early Christians was that God knew this and so entered in the agreement to free humanity. But it's not clear whether or not Jesus, as a human as well as the Son of God, knew this ahead of time, or just entered into it trusting his fate to God. But if God knew this ahead of time, it almost sounds like God tricked the devil. That's actually one of the ways early Christians described it. It seemed fair to them. Because the devil had tricked Adam and Eve in the first place, telling them that if they ate the fruit, they wouldn't die, but would become like God. And so God, you might say, beat the devil at his own game by tricking him into accepting Jesus as a ransom. That's where we're ending this section of our reading from chapter 3. So that was section B. And... Um, We'll be back. You'll have the next section will be coming on Monday. So watch for that then. You'll probably have to give a little intro, won't you? To get back into it. Yeah. Yeah. We will.